Second time, and I call the honourable member for Warringah. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I rise to support this bill. This bill seeks to improve workplace gender equality by committing to closing the gender pay gap and implementing recommendations two, three, five, and nine of the 2021 review um, of the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012. The effect is to improve data collection. Um, uh, and reporting of the current state of the gender pay gap in Australia. Now, we know sunlight is the best disinfectant, so, so it's hope that greater exposure and transparency of the gender pay gap issue will drive improved action to address it. But there are certainly further steps that can be taken. I have to say it is deeply frustrating that here we are in 2023 still having a debate about gender pay equality, still in a situation where the gap is staying stubbornly wide, there is a lack of accountability, transparency and change. It is so frustrating that we are still so far from pay equality. It comp and, and this pay inequality is compounded over the years and the lifespan, the working life uh, of a woman. And we know the gap, the superannuation gap, is not narrowing. We know women over 55 years are the fastest gr group facing homelessness due to their financial circumstances. So we must start somewhere, and I do commend that this bill approaches some aspects of it, but there is a lot more to be done. So where are we at? Our current state. Recent research from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency shows that the gender pay gap in Australia in 2023 is impacting women across every industry, in every occupation and at every uh, life age or life stage. The current overall national gender pay gap sits at 14.1 per cent. That's 0 0.3 percentage points higher than six months ago. So we're not heading in the right direction. Women on average earn $263.90 less per week than men. And this difference combined with cost of living pressures is placing a really significant stress on Australian households, particularly for single parents. KPMG estimates that unequal distribution of household and child rearing labor uh, is responsible for some 39% of the gap something that a strong paid parental leave scheme can improve. It also means that everyone needs to lean in a little more. Right? We, have to, uh, we need to make sure that this is a whole of society issue to ensure we do better. Adding part-time workers' data widens the gender pay gap for all employees to 29.7 per cent. And some of the largest gaps are in professional, scientific and technical services, healthcare, and financial and insurance services, some of the biggest employment sectors in Warringah for my community. So perhaps, and perhaps most disappointingly, despite all the talk and rhetoric and policy intervention, the gap has only closed 5% since 1983. 40 years to reach 5%. It is just unacceptable. So what this bill does, this bill purports to implement in part or in full recommendations 2359 of the review. In reality, however, it only addresses those recommendations in part and it is mystifying to me and to many why it does not address them in full and that really is a question for the government. Added to this, there are other recommendations of the, re of the review which could also have been included but aren't, in particular recommendation 7 which tightens up the reporting requirements and, importantly, recommends amending the Act in line with ABS standards to collect data on non-binary people. Again, it's mystifying why the bill only does half the job, thereby wasting a valuable opportunity. Per Recommendation 2, the bill requires the Workplace Gender Equality Act to publish gender pay gap information of relevant employers for each reporting period, whilst at the same time including provisions protecting confidential data relating to individuals. We have recommendation three titled Bridge the Action Gap with New Gender Equality Standards. This contains two recommendations. Recommendation 3.2 has been implemented through this bill requiring relevant employers to provide executive summary reports and industry benchmark reports to their board or governing body and to report report the date on which this is done, 
But recommendation 3.1, on the other hand, is only partly addressed, and that is where the instrument be amended to do three things. First, to add a new minimum standard to require relevant employers with 500 or more employees to commit to achieve and report their WGEA on measurable to WGEA to on measurable genuine targets to improve gender equality in their workplace against three of the six gender equality indicators. The bill doesn't address this, so I ask the minister and the government why not. Two to strengthen the existing minimum standards to require relevant employers with 500 or more employees to have policies or strategies that cover all six gender equality indicators. Again, this bill does not address these recommendations. Why not? Now, thirdly, to rename the minimum standards to be gender equality standards. This, the least onerous recommendation, has been implemented, thereby allowing the government to proclaim it's implementing this, recommend this recommendation. But again, it's only in part. I don't understand why it's this never quite the whole way when it comes to implementing the recommendation. The bill implements recommendation five to support the respect at work implementation to prevent and address workplace sex-based harassment and discrimination, but deals with this recommendation in a way which is different from the review, though intent, I acknowledge, remains the same. There are some gaps, though, in this legislation. The bill does not address recommendation seven, which encourages the intersectional data collection to reflect the true state of gender equality in the economy. It will paint a more holistic picture to understand how gender interacts with other factors such to contribute to compound the gender pay gap across certain groups, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, women living with disabilities, culturally and linguistically diverse women, young women and non-binary people. Another gap in the bill is that it does not include partnership data. However, this data set is more complex to justify gender gaps Part, uh, in, as partners do not receive a salary, take on more financial risk, their remuneration can often be drawn from the success of their practice and economic trends. The bill also does not address or seek to clarify the superannuation gap between men and women. According to the Australian Human Rights Commission, women retire with a third of the superannuation that men do, and the superannuation gap between men and women in some age groups is as high as 47.8%. So, in summary, the, go the government can, can be uh, congratulated for implementing some of these recommendations, but it is in part. It goes a significant way towards implementing the recommendations of the review. But on a close analysis, it's still half-hearted, um, and there are still so many uh, more aspects of the recommendations that have been left on the table. Transparency is only part of the solution, of course, when we're talking about the gender pay gap. I welcome the commitments from the government to improve gender pay equity, including increased pay parental leave, improved affordability of childcare and increased pay transparency in the Fair Work Amendments. There is a strong economic case for these changes. For example, increasing the paid parental leave entitlements to 26 weeks will cost the government some $600 million per year, but it will add $900 million per year to GDP. So, as well as boosting a mother's lifetime earnings by $30,000. Australia has one of the least generous paid parental leave schemes in the world, highly gendered and discriminatory in considering only a woman's income in the calculation of eligibility. However, these improvements to parental leave policy that have been implemented, they really need to be implemented as soon as, uh, as possible. Uh, we need to start seeing significant changes to workforce structures. The other key driver is improving childcare affordability and accessibility. The government has pledged some $4.5 billion to make childcare more affordable. It will provide much needed support for parents and help women increase their participation in the workforce. However, the sector has called on the government to address the critical worker shortage. Some 7,000 vacancies across the sector in September already last year, and with the government's proposed changes, that could increase to over 25,000, according to some in the sector. Wages increase is necessary to attract and retain an adequate workforce in this female-dominated industry, but of course there needs to be better long-term planning. And finally, and I think as a matter of priority for the government, a key issue that must be addressed in this budget in May 
as a matter of urgency is dealing with the single parent support payment. If the government is serious about addressing pay inequality between men and women, it must address the poorest women that are impacted, which is single mothers. The single parent support payment tells parents, tells single mothers that we appreciate and value your role as mothers raising the future generation, the future of our country, until they turn eight. After that, we will consider you unemployed and we will put you on a job seeker payment. That is unacceptable. It leaves children in situ and, and women in circumstances of having to choose, uh, often in cases of domestic violence, to stay in dangerous situation. It is policy-induced poverty. So many women have come to me and many of my colleagues to talk about how they've had to choose between abandoning uh, hopes of education, of studying, to improve their work prospects because of just that pressure of making ends meet once their child has turned eight. So it really is, if the, if the government is fair dinkum, if they are genuine in wanting to talk about pay and gender equality, we must address those that are the most vulnerable in the system, and that is single mothers. And so we must, as a matter of urgency, change the legislation to ensure the single parent payment goes from being uh, changing at the, when the child reaches the age of eight to being when the child reaches the age of 16. Let's get real. There is so much discrepancy here when it comes to how we as a, uh, the, how the government, how we, uh, our system deals with children. We don't consider them to be responsible enough to vote until they're 18. They can't drink alcohol until they're 18. They can't gamble until they're 18. They start to learn to drive when they're 16, but they can be criminally responsible when they're 10. And we say to parents, they are no longer a priority. It's no longer a priority to parent them, and we won't support you in a parenting role for that child from the age of eight. So let's get real. Where are our priorities? We need to start genuinely addressing pay inequality, and that starts with very simple measures that the government can prioritise in this budget in May. I thank the honourable member for Warringah.